Hello, everybody, and it's great to be in Donegal. We flew into Carrick Finn Airport, and you know, you suddenly realise why it has the reputation of being the most beautiful approach of any airport, I think, in the world. It certainly filled that role today, um, just so very beautiful. I'm going to say a few words, and I'm not pretending here at all, actually, to be the independent journalist, because the issue we're going to talk about has mattered just so much to me in my own life. I was expecting my child at the time of the 1983 amendment, and I was sort of very conscious of the effect this amendment and this new provision was going to have on my life and hers. So it's from the point of view of somebody of that age, I suppose, that I'm speaking. I also grabbed the first position because I'm the oldest person on the panel and I just might run out of energy. So anyway. I remember on a wet day in 2016 and I was on a repeal the 8th march in Dublin and I was with my daughter and I met my sisters with their daughters and I met my cousins with their daughters and behind me was a group of midwives, in front of me was a gang of youngsters soaked to the skin in their black repeal uh, t-shirts. So we were women of all generations marching for our rights to have control over our own bodies and our reproductive lives, rights to be treated in a way that was best for our health, not just to be left until we were dying before any intervention might be made to save our lives. This march wasn't about compassion, it was about rights. And something maybe that I found a little bit hard about the way that the subsequent repeal referendum campaign was conducted was that it emphasized compassion rather than justice. Now, I know that was inevitable. If I'd been running the campaign, I would probably have done the same thing. Irish people are much bigger on compassion, as we all know, than we are on justice. So an approach which was a compassionate approach and emphasized compassion was more likely to win over doubters than a campaign which simply emphasized a woman's right to make up her own mind about her own body. Now, I mean, I think the personal stories of women in the area of rape and incest, fatal fetal abnormality, and the need for women to be in danger of death before an intervention could be made, that did open people's eyes to the cruelty which was often imposed by an absolutist position on abortion. And those persuaded to vote yes as a result of those stories and as a result of the Savita Halapanava case, may account for the particularly high level of the yes vote. But my personal belief is that repeal would have been won if a, if a referendum had been held any time over the last 10 or 15 years. It mightn't have been as overwhelming a majority as it turned out to be, but that it would have passed. The exit poll revealed that many people, 40% or so, said that they had made up their minds long before. Do we believe that? Well, and though compassion may have been the emphasis during the campaign, the exit poll surveys after the vote also showed that most, most people said that they had actually voted first on the basis of women's rights. 62% voted quoted a woman's right to choose as the basic reason for their voting for repeal. That and the fact that almost as many men as women voted yes to repeal, and that most rural as well as urban areas, this constituency excluded, voted overwhelmingly yes. That mattered enormously to people like me, to women like me, who had chafed against this constitutional ban for 35 years, that we weren't being given compassion and pity only, but that our rights were being recognized. So, where does that leave Ireland now after that vote? What are the implications for the Roman Catholic Church, which fought so vehemently against repeal? What are the implications for political parties? What are the implications for women in politics, and particularly for the women involved in this Yes campaign, who, as they claimed on the 26th of May in the yard in Dublin Castle, made history? I'm going to bring you back to 1975, during the period of the Constitutional Convention in Stormont, which so many people here won't remember, but people my age do. And that was the body that followed the collapse of the power-sharing executive. And during one of the debates, a doughty unionist member called Miss Jean Coulter made a memorable intervention. 
Mr. Speaker, she said to the long-suffering Lord Chief Justice Sir Robert Lowry, Mr. Speaker, there's more of the majority than there is of the minority. <laughs> and there, in 10 words, you have the story of Northern Ireland. But that was the story, if you think about it, of the Republic too. There was more of the Roman Catholic majority than there was of the non-Catholic minority. And coming back to this year, there was an interview a week or so after the passing of the uh, repeal the eighth referendum, when I began to take on board the full import of what had happened. Not that Ireland had become a post-Catholic country, that had happened long before, but that the Roman Catholic Church authorities themselves had accepted that that was the case. In an interview on RT Radio 1's This Week, um, Archbishop Eamon Martin said that the Catholic Church might be coming a minority in Ireland, but that people are working to ensure that its views don't become irrelevant. I'm quoting the Archbishop. The Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin, said that he hoped that, and I quote, our congregations will remain a creative minority and not an irrelevant minority. Minority. I mean, to me being the age that I am, that use of the word minority was very instructive. There was a time for my generation when the word minority in Ireland, in the Irish context, meant only one thing, and that was the non-Catholic or the Protestant minority, the 5%, as we used to refer to them as. Here now, it was being applied to the Roman Catholic Church, to, uh, by the Roman Catholic Church itself. Minority was what they were calling their status in the Republic of Ireland. So, Almost 200 years ago, the Irish liberator and human rights activist Daniel O'Connell was preaching the importance of a complete severance of church and state, no matter what the state, no matter what the church. And now, finally, in Ireland, that severance had happened and that severance had been accepted. So what does it mean that the Roman Catholic Church is now in a minority and accepting that it is in a minority? Well, it must have major implications for school ownership, for one. If the Roman Catholic Church is in a minority, how can it be justifiable that 90% of the state's 3,200 primary schools are under Catholic patronage? Certain bishops, like the Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin, sees the pointlessness of hanging on to all that patronage in a situation where population and social changes and stricter rules about the exclusion of any child are going to make it more difficult to maintain a Catholic ethos in many schools. And again, quoting Dermot Martin, the Irish religious education and establishment is fixated on questions of ownership and management, and too little on the purpose of the Catholic school and the outcomes of Catholic education in terms of faith formation. He wants fewer Catholic schools to reflect growing secularization, but wants a greater emphasis in the remaining schools on the Catholic ethos. And he has recognized that efforts to provide greater choice for parents have proven slow and divisive, which is true. Effectively, most bishops have silently hung on to patronage, calculating that many parents don't want change. But some do. Take a piece of evidence. 30% of young couples are choosing a non-church marriage according to the last census. So to reflect the non-religious choice that those couples have made, are 30% of our primary schools non or multi-denominational? No, only two to three percent are. And at the heart of this whole debate is something simple, the Irish Constitution in Article 42.3, which says the state shall not oblige parents in violation of their conscience and lawful preference to send their children to schools established by the state or to any particular type of school designated by the state. So the government was given clear evidence that parents wanted more choices of schools in a Department of Education survey about five years ago ago and by now there are many more such young parents and that demand has in all likelihood grown. That's an issue that's going to have to be addressed and I'll talk a little about it in a minute again. Look at the health service and hospitals. To a great extent 
secularization is already happening in public state funded hospitals. And just look at the leading role played by masters and former masters of some of our biggest maternity hospitals in the Yes campaign, which is in stark contrast, if you remember, to their low profile during the 1983 amendment campaign and tells its own story about the waning of church power in the public hospital sector. So politically, what are the questions that the referendum result raises? What has the vote done to change the political landscape in as far as political parties and women's involvement in the existing political party system is concerned? As the politicians and the journalists and the political establishment calculated who had lost and who had gained politically and did the political accountancy on the day of the count, those outside the official counting rooms the great crowds of mostly women standing in the yard of Dublin Castle, they weren't sweating the small stuff. They were shouting, we made history. We made history. And my drive time colleague, Philip uh, Boucher Hayes, reported on this and reported on the, the, the people, mostly women, who'd been involved in that campaign and said to me, because I chatted to him about it yesterday, he'd spent quite some time on it, and he said, listen, that network of women still exists. Many are people who had pushed through their personal threshold and perhaps reluctance to come out publicly, but people who were not happy with existing political parties and were determined to do the job themselves to make sure the job was done properly. They, in their lifetime, had shown what political power can achieve, and they knew that they could do the same again. The problem is that the most impressive of them, the real activists, were not interested in joining a political party. They were happy to run a parallel process to existing political parties, but not perhaps to join them. Um, many of them asked why, said, well, I don't know that I want to waste 15 years of my life achieving nothing in particular. And remember, they would have been looking at the fact that there had been a movement fighting for repeal of Article of the Eighth Amendment for 35 years and hadn't, hadn't got anywhere. So it wasn't as though they had enormous uh, trust in the existing political uh, party system. They wanted to go for big battles they could win, not small stuff. They liked the camaraderie of a shared campaign of sisterhood, but they weren't looking for individual success. They were not personally ambitious. They weren't even madly self-confident about personally putting themselves forward for jobs because many of them admitted that they were still suffering from that female lack of self-esteem. And I remember one of the women activists interviewed in the Drive Time series by Philip said that her rallying call to her Canvas team every evening was, go out there and carry yourselves with the self-confidence of a mediocre white man. <laughs> so in that context, you know, look at all the candidates that are now putting themselves forward uh, for the presidency. Um, challengers to the incumbent president. All men, I'll skip the adjectives, all men. Why is nobody putting forward names like Alva Smith? The state, um, I'm getting lost here. No, I'm not getting lost. The other aspect that one needs to look at in terms of the sort of issues that these people will, will look at, many of them are interested in the position of women in the home. The whole, is it Article 41 to 1, if I remember rightly, um, where a woman by uh, her labour will not be asked to neglect her duties in the home. Many of them are looking at that and the need perhaps to have another look at that. Many of them are very worried about direct provision. And down in McCroom, I know that they organised um, a particular face-to-face -face meeting between local kids and kids in direct provision, got them all out to play board games and, and talk to one another. Um, this was something they personally um, wanted, to, uh, wanted to take on board. You know, numbers of particular things they wanted to take on board. And of course, one of the biggest ones that they would be likely to take on board if they were to look at single-issue campaigns would be childcare and the failure in this country to provide a proper childcare system, largely, I think, because that special article is there in the Constitution guaranteeing the woman's right in the home, uh, position in the home, and no political party wants to be seen to advantage a working woman, a work, 
a working mother over women or parents who choose to stay in the home. That's one of the reasons that we have a chaotic childcare system, um, which at one stage three years ago was one of the most expensive in the European Union. That's changed a bit recently because of um, the Minister Zappone's um, extra money that she put in there, extra subsidy that she put in there. But it's still an issue, and it's an issue largely because many of the main political parties have not taken on board women's equal right to work. Uh, that's, it, it's extraordinary in this day and age that that should be still an issue, and that there is a clause in our constitution that supports that view. So there's work to be done and, and many of these women who found that by taking on board this particular issue, a single issue, focusing on it, following it down the line, using modern communication methods, um, realized that actually they can win. There are other ways to go about achieving the sort of things that you want and that perhaps existing political parties aren't necessarily offering you the way. Um, so the big, though, and most immediate change, immediately it strikes me as a result of that referendum result, is that organisations and events like this one will ignore the issues that women care about at their peril. And any event which produces the sort of outdated agenda that this summer school produced earlier this summer deserves the tsunami of criticism that it got. But the, listener, the organizers listened. That's the big thing. The organizers listened. And as a result, they changed the agenda. They didn't say, they didn't try to argue their way out of it by saying we're right. They put their hands up and they said, actually, yeah, we boobed. And we are going to take this on board and we're going to do something about it. And they tried hard to learn that lesson. And in the end, we all have to learn from one another. And I think it's a very positive thing that this school did its damnedest to change that agenda in the short time that it had to reflect the fact that it had not taken on board the momentous events, particularly of that vote of May the 25th. And I think in the debates that have been organized, it is shown that they have indeed taken that on board. As I say, we all learn from one another all the time. But women and those men who have always supported women's rights have had to wait for 35 years for the repeal of a constitutional provision that should never have been introduced in the first place. And I'll tell you what, a 35-year wait makes you pretty impatient, particularly when you know that this repeal could probably have happened over a decade ago if there was a political party brave enough to run with it. So that new energy, that new impatience could take many forms. Yeah, it could mean more women in existing political parties. It could mean a new political party. Or it could mean a now a flying column or a mobile brigade of uh, mostly female activists taking single issue campaigns with the experience and the social media savvy and self-confidence uh, of that resounding political success behind them. Whatever way they choose to go, they now know that they're able to get results and they now know how to ensure that they'll never be ignored again. Thank you.